Well, good evening, CBC. It's good to be with you again on Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. Um, this has been quite a day. And I, hopefully you enjoyed worshiping, even though it was online. And again, uh, we're continuing to learn and adjust to a new normal. I just realized that we started these 516 nightly devotionals um, back in March. I think March 18th or 19th was our first one. and So we've been going about this for about four weeks. And to be honest with you, I thought we would probably be doing these nightly devotionals uh, leading up to Easter. And, and hopefully then the stay-at-home order would end and we'd be able to sort of go back to uh, normal. But looks like it may continue on. So we're going to try to continue some of these nightly devotionals. I don't know how long we can keep it up, but hopefully you've been encouraged by them. And we're going to try to keep going nightly, uh, at least for the next few weeks if we can, or at least for the next week if we can, and then just evaluate. Uh, Lord willing, um, we'll be able to meet again face-to-face and corporately in the next uh, few weeks. That's at least my hope. And of course, that's a great word, that word hope. Sort of goes along with um, the whole theme of Easter and the reality of having hope. And I think like um, you, when you read the newspaper, uh, you don't often get a lot of hope, and but you, you cling to hope because as you look towards the future, you need something to hold on to, something that can give you encouragement. And so Easter is a reminder that we have a living hope, a hope that can last. Hopefully you enjoyed uh, my wife last night making Easter cookies. Uh, that's something we've done as a family, and I appreciate her doing that. In fact, I have an Easter cookie here. I encourage you to also grab a cup of coffee if you want to. Uh, I'm going to share a little bit about the resurrection tonight and then uh, on Facebook Live. And then if you want to join us on Zoom, you're welcome to. We somewhat continue a little discussion. Um, won't necessarily be a long one tonight, but if you have any questions about the resurrection or anything we've talked about over the last few weeks um, with our Bible study, you're welcome to ask. But this is a resurrection cookie. Pretty good. It's white. I don't know if you can tell, probably not, but it's kind of, it's empty on the middle. Creates a nice little tomb, and it's a great way to illustrate with your children about the resurrection in the empty tomb. So now I just want to share a little bit about the resurrection, why it's so important for our faith, and just spend a few minutes uh, looking at 1 Corinthians 15. And then, like I said, if you want to join us on Zoom afterwards, I'm going to post just below this, I'm going to post the link, and you could click on that and join us on Zoom. But just looking at 1 Corinthians 15, I just want to share three thoughts on the resurrection tonight. And the first is that the resurrection is a key component of the gospel. So often when we talk about the gospel, we emphasize the death of Jesus on the cross, which of course is the centerpiece. Um, Paul preached Christ and him crucified and said, God forbid if I boast in anything but the cross of Christ. And yet when you come to 1 Corinthians 15, you find out that the gospel is not just Christ dying on the cross. It's also the fact that Christ rose again. Here's what Paul says. Moreover, brethren, I declare to you the gospel which I preached to you, which also you received, and in which you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. For I deliver to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures, and that he was seen by Cephas, and then by the twelve. After that, he was seen by over five hundred brethren, at once of whom the greater part remained to the present, but some have fallen asleep. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles. And so the, the first thing I want to emphasize is the gospel, I mean the resurrection, is a key component of the gospel of Christ. And why is that? Why is it such a key component? Um, What makes it something that is indispensable to the gospel? Well, because uh, Paul's going to later on say this in 1 Corinthians 15, if Christ did not rise from the dead, then you are still in your sins. Your faith is uh, futile. And so if Christ just merely died on the cross, but he did not rise again, what Paul is saying in in this chapter is that we would still be in our sins. Now, I think the reason that the resurrection is so important is because sin and death are linked together. Uh, when sin entered this world, death entered as well. And so they're almost like twin enemies. 
And the way that we know that Christ defeated sin was because of the resurrection, he defeated death. And because he defeated death, we know he defeated sin. Later on in 1 Corinthians 15, he's going to say that the sting of death is sin. And so death's very stinger, so to speak, is sin. And so if sin is destroyed, that means death has to be destroyed. And the way we know sin is destroyed is because death has been destroyed. I think of the story in Mark 2 where Jesus, uh, the paralytic, is lowered down in front of Jesus. He's in, he's in Capernaum. Uh, the crowds are so thick that they have to lower this man down in front of Jesus. And the first thing Jesus says is, your, your sins are forgiven. Because of your faith, your sins are forgiven. And, of course, people there are just like uh, blasphemy. How can anyone forgive sins? And what does Jesus say? Uh, to forgive sins, I mean, to prove that I've forgiven sins, I'm going to tell this man to take up his bed and walk. And so the display of his power was the confirmation that he could forgive sins, that he had authority to forgive sins. Well, the same way, the display of his power in defeating death shows us his authority to forgive sins, that he is the one who, when he declared it is finished, it was finished. And by defeating sin, he defeated death. And he proved that by rising from the dead. I like what John MacArthur says. He says this, The truth of the resurrection gives life to every other area of gospel truth. The resurrection is the pivot on which all of Christianity turns and without which none of the other truths would much matter. Without the resurrection, Christianity would be, would be so much wishful thinking taking its place alongside other human philosophy and religious speculation. And so Jesus proved that he was who he said he was by his resurrection from the dead. Same thing in John 11, uh, when he says, I am the resurrection and life. He who believes in me, though he may die, yet he shall live. And he who believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Well, how does he show that he is the resurrection and life? Well, he proves it by rising from the dead, raising Lazarus in John 11, but really showing his power by his own resurrection from the dead. If he truly is the resurrection and the life, then death cannot defeat him. If death has more power than him, then he would not be Lord. He would not be Savior. But because he is Savior and Lord, he um, is the one who is the resurrection and the life. I oftentimes use the illustration that if I were to write you a check for a million dollars and hand you that check, you might be excited for a few uh, moments until you go to the bank and you realize that uh, I can write checks for a million dollars all day long, but I have no money in my bank account to make that check any good. Well, Christ, when he says it is finished and the debt is paid, proved that he had the money in the bank. He, he was sufficient by his resurrection from the dead. So it's vital that in understanding the gospel that we understand that the core of it, and I want you to understand this is the core of it. Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. He was buried, proving that he died, that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen. The death and resurrection of Christ are the core of the good news. We have no message. There is no gospel. There is no good news if there is no death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's why that is at the heart of everything we believe. Second thing, so it's not only the key, a key component of the gospel, the resurrection, but it's also I've called the key apologetic of our witness. Basically, in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul invites the whole world to evaluate the truth of Christianity based on the resurrection. This is where he goes on and says, If Christ has preached that he has been raised from the dead, now how do some among you say that there's no resurrection of the dead? If there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, our preaching is vain and your faith is also vain. Yes, and we're found false witnesses of God because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up if in fact the dead do not rise. For the dead do not rise, and Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. And so what Paul does is something that is um, unfathomable. He basically takes Christianity out of the realm of religion, out of the realm of sort of values or some of the things that people talk about, and puts it squarely in the place of truth and history and says it is falsifiable. If you can disprove the resurrection, then all of Christianity falls. I can remember being in, 
uh, early on in my high school days when it finally began to un I understood that the resurrection was like a key foundation to Christianity that what Paul was basically saying here is that um, there is no Christian faith everything is worthless everything is vain if Christ did not rise from the dead and so it really puts the emphasis on the fact that Christianity you can't just say well yeah it's just a religion or um, it's just like every other religion it teaches some good things no Christianity invites you to say it's either true or false um, C.S. Lewis said Christianity is either uh, extremely important or not important at all what it cannot be is moderately important because it's claiming that Christ is Lord and defeated death and if he did not defeat death then the whole system the whole faith collapses upon itself uh, Tim Keller said this if Jesus rose from the dead then you have to accept all that he said if he didn't rise from the dead then why worry about any of what he said the issue on which everything hangs is not whether or not you like his teaching but whether or not he rose from the dead and so Christ uh, is Lord and he's shown it by his resurrection from the dead and uh, the earliest apostles, if you read the book of Acts, which has been shown to be historically accurate, preached the resurrection over and over again. Think about that. That was just uh, weeks, uh, days after um, uh, the resurrection, or weeks after the resurrection, in Jerusalem, the very place where the crucifixion took place, the very place where Christ had been buried, they preached the resurrection over and over again. If anyone could have disproved uh, the resurrection, if anyone could have produced Christ's body, if anyone could have shown that the tomb was not empty, Christianity, we wouldn't even know about it today because it would have collapsed. But there, right in the middle of the heart of everything that took place, Christianity was preached and it spread like wildfire fire throughout the Roman Empire and it was all based on the resurrection. If the disciples knew it was a lie, then they were all willing to go to their deaths for something they absolutely knew was not true. And yet they preached the resurrection. Their lives had been changed. People's lives were changed because of the resurrection. And if you go to some just basic undeniable truths, uh, almost every reputable historian knows that Christ died. They know that there was a claim that he rose again, or that's how Christianity started, and that they know that Christianity spread like wildfire with Paul, the Apostle Paul, being one of the greatest converts. And the only thing that makes sense of that is the actual resurrection from the dead. And Paul invites people to examine that. So, resurrection is a key part of the gospel. Resurrection is a key part of our apologetics. The third thing I'd say is the resurrection is a key part of our hope, or the key event in our hope. And the last thing I just want to read is 1 Corinthians uh, 15, 20-26. It's what was read today during our worship service. But now Christ has risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father, when he puts an end to all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that will be destroyed is death. And... Uh, I think all of us um, have experienced someone who's close to us um, who's died. Um, we've all been touched by death. We all know that death is a reality. We can sugarcoat it all we want. But the last enemy to be destroyed, again, I, I like that verse because it reminds us that death is an enemy. It has, it's an invader. It's a, a cancer in this world. It entered with sin. And like I said, sin and death go hand in hand. And so death is the last enemy that will be destroyed. And Christ is the first fruits. I love the fact that he died on Passover. And uh, if you understand the Jewish feasts, then the, the day after the Sabbath of Passover was the feast of first fruits, where they would wave sort of the first fruits of the harvest and trusting that there would be a greater harvest to come. Well, what was the day after the Sabbath of Passover? Well, it's Sunday. And the reason believers worship on Sunday is because we're proclaiming every Sunday. It's not just on Easter. Every Sunday that we meet, we are claiming that we are resurrection people who trust in the bodily, historical, literal, physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that that is at the 
core of our hope. Because if Christ is the first fruits, then there's going to be a harvest to come. And who's part of the harvest? Well, that's us. And the hope is, not in some ethereal, weird, nirvana kind of heaven, the hope is in the fact that this body of ours uh, will be redeemed, will be transformed. I love the picture of uh, Paul later on where he talks about the difference between a seed and a plant. Uh, the seed and the plant are the same thing. But one has, I mean, I mean who, who puts seeds up in their house and, or gives rose seeds to their wife and gives them a dozen rose, rose seeds and says, look, honey, I, I bought you some roses. Uh, but yet that seed is the same as the roses, but the roses have a glory that is uh, unsurpassed. And so we, this body like ours is like a seed, and there's a glory that we can't even fathom that's going to be ours with our resurrection body. And the assurance of that is Christ's resurrection. Because he rose, we have confidence in our own resurrection. And I, and I love the, um, uh, the process, I guess, or the, how God works in salvation. He, doesn't, he begins with our spirit, regenerated, reborn, then he begins to renew our mind, intellect, emotions, and will. And the last part of our salvation is the redemption of our bodies. And because of that, because of that hope, he ends chapter 15 by saying this, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And so the hope of the resurrection is what encourages us. No matter how difficult life can get, no matter what death may do, no matter what sickness may do, no matter how dark the world becomes, the resurrection gives us hope. He says, be steadfast and immovable. You have a certainty. You have a rock. You have a promise that you can hold on to and always abound in the work of the Lord. Don't, it's not just a, a defense. It's not just stability. It's also that motivation to continue to serve the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. I think someone has said that hope is holding on to holding on to promises eternal. And the promise eternal that we have is that uh, the one who uh, defeated death is also going to resurrect us and that all things work together for good to those who love God and called according to his purpose because we have an assurance that his promises are true. Probably one of the better <clears throat> illustrations I've used of hope is, uh, and what it does for us is uh, once I was on a trip and it was right during a bowl game. Back, back then, I was a big Florida State Seminole fan, and I think Florida State was playing Nebraska and Fiesta Bowl or some bowl. And um, because I was on an airplane trip, uh, I wasn't able to, uh, to watch the game. And I can remember my best friend picking me up at the airport, and I just was wanting to know one thing, who won the game. And he just looked at me, and he said, Florida State won. And uh, so we went home. He had recorded the game. Now I'm back on the old VCR. And we sat there and watched the game. And because I already knew the ending, that Florida State was going to win, even though that game was a very close game and a lot of uh, bad plays done by FSU and a lot of other things going on, I already knew the ending, and it changed the way I watched the game. Because any time that they got behind or any time it seemed like they were definitely going to lose, I already knew the ending. And because I knew the ending, it changed my whole perspective on everything that happened in that game. And that's the same thing that we have. Because we know the ending, it changes everything that we, um, our perspective on everything that happens in this life. So I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know how discouraged you are. I'm sure as this goes on, it's going to get more difficult and perseverance will become a little bit more challenging. But just keep holding on to promises eternal. And the resurrection gives us hope. And I hope it can also give you some joy and perseverance in the midst of what you're going through. If you want to join us on Zoom, um, I'm going to try to post that as soon as I can, right afterwards. I'm going to post it right, in fact, you know, while I'm still talking, let me see if I can do this. Uh, this is called multitasking, which is not something that most men are uh, able to do. But I'm going to post it right now on the same spot where this is being broadcast on Facebook Live. Uh, I hope I'm going to post a link that will take you to Zoom. And if you want to join us on Zoom to just continue the discussion, we'd love to have you. Um, and uh, like I said, I don't know how long our conversation will be. But, um, okay. 
I just posted a link on right underneath the video. And if you want to join, we'd love to have you. Let me close in a word of prayer. Uh, thank you for the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. Thank you that our faith rests on a sure foundation, the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And uh, encourage our hearts on this Resurrection Sunday. And in the midst of everything going on and the challenges we face, I pray that we'd be steadfast and immovable and always abound in the work of the Lord, knowing that our labor for you is not in vain. Thank you for Jesus. We give him all the praise. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks for joining us. Hopefully you can join us on Zoom. And um, again, hang in there, CBC. And we look forward to the day we can celebrate Easter Sunday, whatever day that is. Celebrate it together corporately and sing praises to our God and lift our voices together with one voice for his glory. Thank you and have a good evening.